Welcome to the fourth big event of Cleveland Book Week. Thank you so much for coming. I'm Karen Long, manager of the Annisfield Wolf Book Awards, part of the Cleveland Foundation, and we are all in for an exceptional treat. Tonight, we acknowledge the Shawnee, Miami, Erie, Ottawa, Potawatomi, and Haudenosaunee Confederacy, whose waters we stand along, and the thousands of Native Americans representing more than 100 nations who live in Northeast Ohio today. The waters here at the confluence of Lake Erie and the Cuyahoga River are still sacred. They will become a little more so tonight, blessed by the words of the poets ahead. Now, please help me welcome Lydia Minnell, who leads the remarkable series we call Brews and Prose. Thank you. Um, this past summer, Brews and Prose celebrated its seventh anniversary of gathering readers and writers on the first Tuesday of every month at Market Garden Brewery. For most of that time, we've had the distinct pleasure of partnering each September with our friends from Annisfield Wolf. Our monthly readings are all about the notion that we should gather to encounter writing outside the academy, closer to the places we live, the places we work, the places we encounter each other. Our happy partnership with Annisfield Wolf has kept us true to that mission. Our book week collaborations have found us in boxing rings, cathedrals, museums, theaters, downtown courtyards, and this year, at the foot of the steamship Mather. At Brews and Prose, we frequently joke that literature is better with beer. But the truth is, <laughs> the truth is, even without beer, literature is better everywhere Clevelanders are. We're looking forward to testing that hypothesis next month as a partner at the second Cleveland Drafts Literary Festival this year in Larchmere. That festival will hold readings from Northeast Ohio writers in bars and bookstores and glass-blowing studios and car garages, all along the way celebrating our vibrant community in progress. Then in November, we'll be back at our home at Market Garden Brewery with Cleveland's own Mary Daria Russell. I hope you'll drop by those events and tonight visit our table for more information. Thanks first to our hosts at the Great Lakes Science Center for welcoming, welcoming us to the Mather. It is impossible also to express gratitude to our partners with the Annisfield Wolf Book Awards and Cleveland Book Week. Karen Long and Stephanie Hicks Thompson, we are in the middle of their yearly literary Super Bowl and they don't even look like they're sweating it. None of this would exist without Karen and Stephanie's incredible effort, hospitality, and curatorial brilliance. They deserve our thanks, all of us, for everything they've done and will do this week, and for doing more than their part to make Cleveland's literary community vibrant. Let's give them a round of applause. Now, I am thrilled to welcome Shonda Feldman to begin our evening together. If you heard a catch in my voice before I said Shonda's name, it's because I was tempted to say our own Shonda Feldman, as in Cleveland's Shonda Feldman. The truth is, Shonda didn't grow up here, but we're grateful she landed here as a visiting professor at Oberlin. Grateful because her work manages to be rural and suburban, historical and immediate, cultural and familial all through the piercing detail of everyday life. Shonda's poems have appeared in the Cincinnati Review, Prairie Schooner, the Southern Review, and Virginia Quarterly Review, among others. And she has received awards and fellowships from the Breadloaf Writers Conference, the Cave Conum Foundation, the National Endowment for the Arts, and the Vermont Studio Center. And she was a Wallace Stegner Fellow at Stanford University. In 2018, Louisiana State University Press published her full-length collection, Approaching the Fields, and we were lucky to host her last year at Brews and Prose. When I heard her read, I knew what I'm even more sure of now. In a political climate where pundits search for all-encompassing narratives of rural and southern places, from so-called regional prophets touting grand memoirs of culture, 
Shonda's poetry uses voices and places and traditions, familial and individual depth to resist the monolithic. In short, it does what Tracy K. Smith's political poem suggests. It says, hello, and you there, and still, and yes. Here is a poetry for us right now. Please welcome Shonda Feldman. Good evening. I'd like to say thank you to Lydia for that lovely introduction and to Bruise and Prose, and also thank you to Karen and Annisfield Wolf and the Cleveland Foundation. And it's such an honor to be here tonight with you, Tracy. Thank you as well. Um, I'm happy to offer a poem from Approaching the Fields to begin our night. Native. Forget kudzu, that closed weave, its green congesting trees, the way it twins a telephone line's length with vine, its only message to overrun. Forget the river's muscled sweep, where nothing intrudes and stays the same water changing what it washes through, retooled stone, redrafted bank. Forget the difference between foreign and native. Anything can take hold here and spread. Indiscriminate landscape. Even the road flinches alive. A snake whips dust and slinks to a ditch. Air's adaptive lifts whatever needs flight. Spore or song, the day's margins blur, dark and light. Forget the dead stay down. They persist as haints. A murky story sticks to any relationship, beloved, or despised. A confederation binds enemy and alliance, just as the ground takes us in and decay makes us kin. Thank you. I have the privilege and honor of introducing poet Tracy K. Smith to you this evening. I want to tell you about some of my encounters with Tracy's work. When I read her first book, The Body's Question, the winner of the 2002 Cave Canem First Book Prize, I was immediately struck by the range of concerns the book touches upon, desire, the body's physicality, spirituality, language, and the reverberation of these themes as they were examined through the lens of family, intimate relationships, and travel. I also remember falling in love with the voice of these poems. They are plain spoken yet precise. An example from Nina Fantasma. When he comes, Mario asks, oiste la lluvia? And it sounds so perfect, I ask him to say it again. Oiste la lluvia? For rain so sudden, it is love. Hunger in a foreign language. Rain that bathed the mangroves. Coconut orchard, the clay earth. Here is the full turn of attention to the sound of rain, to listening to its language. A moment slowed down so as to apprehend its wonder. The ordinary becomes an extraordinary experience. 
the beauty of the writing itself, the long, luxuriating repetition of A sounds in rain that bathed the mangroves, up against the cacophonous hard seas in the line coconut orchard, the clay earth, made me want to keep reading in order to hear this poet narrate the world. As much as Tracy's poems observe the everyday, they are also propelled by questioning the complexity and largeness of our experiences and dealing head on with the un incomprehensible and ineffable. From her book, Life on Mars, Tracy writes in My God, It's Full of Stars, maybe the dead know, their eyes widening at last, seeing the high beams of a million galaxies flick on at twilight, hearing the engines flare, the horns not letting up, the frenzy of being. I want to be one notch below bedlam, like a radio without a dial, wide open so everything floods in at once and sealed tight so nothing escapes. It may seem self-evident that poetry can handle our greatest fears and hopes, but it takes a poet like Tracy of intellectual vigor and bravery to take the contemporary poem to these places, to the verge of what words can hold. I admire how her poems and prose insist on boldness, insist upon talking about what is uneasy in these times about God, about racism, about other injustices in this nation and in other nations and in our histories, and yet still claim a steadfast allegiance to love, that jubilant and turbulent wellspring in our lives. I just have a little more to say about Tracy and then she'll, we'll get to hear from her. <laughs> After reading Tracy's first book in 2003, little did I know that I would get to meet her in 2004 at the Cave Canem annual summer retreat for African American poets. And little did I know that we would be assigned to the same workshop group. I think I was too in awe of Tracy to say much to her at the time. But what I remember is listening to her in workshop talk fluently and deeply about poetry and asking generous but exacting questions about what our writing and progress was up to. And I also remember the dance party on our last night at the retreat <laughs> and eyeing Tracy's long-legged moves and thinking she is being herself, her full self. She brings her full presence to the spaces she inhabits just as she does in her poems. Tracy K. Smith is the recipient of the 2019 Annisfield Wolf Book Award for her poetry collection, Wade in the Water. She has served two terms as United States Poet Laureate, and she's a professor in and director of Princeton Uni University's Creative Writing Program. Her other books of poetry are Life on Mars, which won the Pulitzer Prize, Duende and the Body's Question. Tracy's memoir is Ordinary Light and was a finalist for the National Book Award. She's written the introduction to a new book, American Journal, 50 Poems for Our Time, and she hosts the poetry podcast called The Slowdown. Please join me in welcoming Tracy K. Smith. Thank you, Shonda, for such a generous and beautiful introduction. I was thinking about our dancing when you got to Cave Canem and what a joyful space that was for really thinking about this thing that we love and feeling the safety of community and the inspiration of so many people who um, have questions. So I'm really excited to see you again. And it was lovely to hear your beautiful work. So thank you. Um, 
thinking about the many legacies that we become a part of and the, the history that we're building um, together, even if that's not what we think we're doing, um, makes me want to start with a really brief poem. Um, I feel like a lot of the poems that I write are um, thought experiments, um, ways of saying, how can I make this predicament that we belong to, which is life, make a different kind of sense, even a momentary kind of sense. So this is a little poem that attempts to do that. And it has begun to rain behind me. I think that's probably a benediction of some kind. <laughs> the everlasting self comes in from a downpour, shaking water in every direction, a collaborative condition, gathered, shed, spread, then forgotten, reabsorbed, like love from a lifetime ago, and mud a dog has tracked across the floor. Um, I feel like um, many of us are thinking in different ways about history in part because the present moment that we live in feels like it's beckoning so much history that had felt at one point so comfortably behind us to inch upon us. Um, that's where a lot of the poems in Wade in the Water come from for me, particularly um, questions and anxieties I have about uh, the way that racism still drives so much of our life as Americans and the ways that we have failed to really reckon with the, the sins of our past as a nation and to um, adequately apologize to one another, to choose to see one another. Um, I think my poems are saying, how can we do better right now? But in order to feel a little bit of space within that question, they're looking backward to a time where it seems very easy to identify what could or should have happened differently. Um, I think I'll start with a poem that kind of goes back to the beginning of, of this country's declared um, principles. It's called Declaration, and it's a redaction or an erasure of the Declaration of Independence. When I was uh, looking at that document again with the idea of getting a poem from it, I was saying, oh, please speak to me. Please show me something that I haven't already seen. And if you're a poet, maybe you recognize that wish that something else is helping or, or present, even just listening as you're, you're making your, your work. Um, in this instance, I felt kind of frightened when it seemed like something did say, oh, OK, you want to hear something? Listen to this. Declaration. He has sent hither swarms of officers to harass our people. He has plundered our, ravaged our, destroyed the lives of our, taking away our, abolishing our most valuable and altering fundamentally the forms of our. In every stage of these oppressions, we have petitioned for redress in the most humble terms. Our repeated petitions have been answered only by repeated injury. We have reminded them of the circumstances of our emigration and settlement here, taken captive on the high seas to bear. I want to center um, black life, I think, in the poems that I'm going to read tonight. 
um, I feel so um, grateful to belong to a tradition that has given so much that is beautiful and loving and generative um, and thoughtful and challenging to this nation. Um, I hear blackness in very quiet gestures in this book, as well as the poems that are, are taking on aspects of um, very clear racial history. But this is a poem where I hear, um, hear that presence as well. The Angels. Two slung themselves across chairs once in my motel room, grizzled in leather biker gear, emissaries for something I needed to see. I was worn down by an awful panic, a wrenching in the gut, contortions. They sat there at the table while I slept. I could sense them with a deck of playing cards between them. To think of how they smelled, what comes to mind is rum and gasoline. And when they spoke, though I couldn't, I dared not look, I glimpsed how one's teeth were ground down almost to nubs, which makes me hope some might be straight up thugs, young, slim, raw, who bounce and roll with fearsome grace, whose very voices cause faint souls to quake. Quake then, fools, and fall away. What God do you imagine we obey? Think of the toil we must cost them, one scaled perfectly to eternity. And still they come, telling us through the ages not to fear. Just those two, that once, and never again for me since, though there are, are there, sightings, flashes, Hence, a proud tree in vivid sun, branches swaying in strong wind, rain hurling itself at the roof, boulders, mounds of earth mistaken for dead does, lions in crouch, a rust-stained pipe where a house once stood, which I take each time I pass it for an owl. Bright whirl, so dangerous and near. My mother sat whispering with it at the end of her life, while all the rooms of our house filled up with night. Several years ago, on what was the 150th anniversary of the beginning of the Civil War, um, I was one of a number of poets who were invited to contribute Civil War poems to an exhibition at the Smithsonian. And um, I really wanted to write a poem, but I had so many anxieties about addressing the Civil War. Growing up, I always had this I instinctive discomfort whenever the topic came up in history class and the debate arose as to whether or not it was a war to end slavery. Um, but I thought if I could find some documents that would give voice to what black people experienced during the Civil War, I could find my way in. And I found two really wonderful sources that had hundreds of letters and deposition statements that black families and soldiers wrote to one another and to President Lincoln during the war. And then after the war, well into the 20th century, depositions that veterans, black veterans, gave in an attempt to claim the pensions that they ought to have been entitled to as US veterans. Um, 
those voices, which initially I thought I would just kind of gobble up in the way that we read something that's really useful and meaningful and then turn into a poem in my own voice, were so compelling that I really just wanted to get out of the way and invite other people to listen to those voices with me because they seem to be speaking a very clear, unmistakable kind of truth of, of conscience. Um, I'm gonna read you two sections of a poem that's called, I will tell you the truth about this. I will tell you all about it. And each section is kind of a chorus of many different voices that seem to be, as I understand them, telling a single story. Excellent sir. My son went in the 54th regiment, sir. My husband, who is in Company K, 22nd Regiment, U.S. Colored Troops, and now in the Macon Hospital at Portsmouth with a wound in his arm, has not received any pay since last May, and then only $13. Sir, we the members of Company D, of the 55th Massachusetts Volunteers call the attention of your excellency to our case. For instant, look and see that we never was freed yet, run right out of slavery, in to soldiery, and we hadn't nothing at all and our wives and mother, most all of them, is a perishing all about, and we all are perishing ourselves. I am willing to be a soldier and serve my time faithful like a man, but I think it is hard to be put off in such doggish manner as that. Will you see that the colored men fighting now are fairly treated? You ought to do this and do it at once, not let the thing run along. Meet it quickly and manfully. We poor oppressed ones appeal to you and ask fair play. So please, if you can do any good for us, do it in the name of God. Excuse my boldness, but please, your reply will settle the matter and will be appreciated by a colored man who is willing to sacrifice his son in the cause of freedom and humanity. I have nothing more to say, hoping that you will lend a listening ear to an humble soldier. I will close. Yours for Christ's sake, I shall have to send this without a stamp, for I hate money enough to buy a stamp. I am 60 odd years of age. I am 62 years of age next month. I am about 65 years of age. I reckon I am about 67 years old. I am about 68 years of age. I am on the rise of 80 years of age. I am 89 years old. I am 94 years of age. I don't know my exact age. I am the claimant in this case. I have testified before you two different times before. I filed my claim, I think, first about 12 years ago. I'm now an applicant for a pension because I understand that all soldiers are entitled to a pension. I claim pension under the general law on account of disease of eyes as a result of smallpox contracted in service. The varicose veins came on both my legs soon after the war, and the sores were there when I first put in my claim. I claim pension for rheumatism and got my toe broke, and I was struck in the side with the breech of a gun, breaking my ribs. I was a man stout and healthy, over 27 years of age when I enlisted. 
When I enlisted, I had a little mustache and some chin whiskers. I was a green boy right off the farm and did just what I was told to do. When I went to enlist, the recruiting officer said to me, your name is John Wilson. I said, no, my name is Robert Harrison. But he put me down as John Wilson. I was known while in service by that name. I cannot read nor write. And I do not know how my name was spelled when I enlisted, nor do I know how it is spelled now. I always signed my name while in the army by making my mark. I know my name by sound. My mother said after my discharge that the reason the officer put my name down as John Wilson was he could draw my bounty. I am the son of Solomon and Lucinda Sibley. I am the only living child of Dennis Campbell. My father was George Jordan, and my mother was Millie Jordan. My mother told me that John Barnett was my father. My mother was Mary Eliza Jackson, and my father, Reuben Jackson. My name on the roll was Frank Nunn. No, sir, it was not Frank Nern. My full name is Dick Lewis Barnett. I am the applicant for pension on account of having served under the name Lewis Smith, which was the name I wore before the days of slavery were over. My correct name is Hiram Kirkland. Some persons call me Harry, and others call me Henry. But neither is my correct name. Thank you. Uh, that has never happened before. <laughs> That's very unusual. I'm going to say it's ancestral support or uh, kind of like chastening in some way. Um, maybe I'll read two more poems and then uh, we can have a conversation if you have any questions. Um, the last poem that I read uh, really stuck with me for a long time because so many of the people that were making these claims and serving um, this country didn't ever receive their pensions. If you think about it, um, there's an easy legal explanation, though I think it falls short morally, but if you were born into slavery, you did not get a birth certificate. If you were married during slavery, you didn't get a marriage license. If you chose to change your name upon emancipation, you weren't always given paperwork to that effect. And so people had a hard time proving that they were who they had been in the, in the, the army. And a great many people were denied the justice of a pension. Um, reading those appeals, um, I think one of the most recent ones that I drew from came from like 1938. So it was people's grandchildren and great-grandchildren who were trying to... Um, trying to close this loop up that I think in many cases never closed. Um, but that sense of naming is what stuck with me. And I feel like a name is, um, is not just a symbolic marker. Um, and so this next poem is not rooted in the past, but I think the appeal that's being made to be seen correctly and called within one's proper name um, is ongoing for many of us. This is a guzzle. The sky is a dry, pitiless white. The wide rows stretch on into death. Like famished birds, my hands strip each stalk of its stolen crop, our name. History is a ship forever setting sail. On either shore, mountains of men, oceans of bone, an engine whose teeth shred all that is not our name. 
Can you imagine what will sound from us, what we'll rend and claim when we find ourselves alone with all we've ever sought, our name? Or perhaps what we seek lives outside of speech, like a tribe of goats on a mountain above a lake whose hooves nick away at rock. Our name is blown from tree to tree, scattered by the breeze. Who am I to say what in that marriage is lost? For all I know, the grass has caught our name. Will it thunder up the call of time or lie quiet as bedrock beneath our feet? Our name, our name, our name, our fraught, fraught name. And um, thank you, thank you very much. Um, I'll close with the title poem, Wade in the Water. Um, think, as you can imagine, this history is awful. Um, and researching it and thinking about it was, was illuminating, and it was also um, kind of a, a burden to kind of carry in a way. Um, and while I was working on those questions, I took a trip to um, rural Georgia, and I went to a ring shout, which, as you know, is a tradition of praise and fellowship in the black community. It has strong ties to West African tradition, and the vehicle for this, this sense of ceremony is the spiritual. And all of the spirituals have a meaning on the surface that lines up with a sense of God as someone who cares about all of us, um, and that takes us back to stories from the Old Testament. But under the surface, there's always another useful message for somebody who might be seeking freedom. Um, and I think the song Wade in the Water is no exception. Um, so at this event, there was a woman who was performing and, um, sorry, I'm just gonna do it karaoke style. <laughs> Um, a woman who was performing and she greeted me and everyone else that she saw that night by saying, I love you, and just giving a, a really beautiful kind of recognition. And with all of the things that were going on in my mind, that um, felt like the most beautiful gift that someone could choose to give, to say, I see you, you are meaningful, I don't know you, and yet I love you. Um, I took that home with me, and it really changed the vocabulary that I wanted to engage in with thinking about aspects of this history. And love became what I was looking for. Opportunities to learn to practice love better became the goal of you know, so many of the questions that these poems were helping me to ask. So I love to read this poem um, and to call out the beautiful woman whose name is Bertha McKnight. Um, who's a member of the Geechee Gullah Ring Shouters, and this is Wade in the Water. One of the women greeted me. I love you, she said. She didn't know me, but I believed her, and a terrible new ache rolled over in my chest, like in a room where the drapes have been swept back. I love you, I love you, as she continued down the hall, past other strangers, each feeling pierced suddenly by pillars of heavy light. I love you throughout the performance in every hand clap, every stomp. I love you in the rusted iron chains someone was made to drag until love let them be unclasped and left empty in the center of the ring. I love you in the water where they pretended to wade, singing that old blood deep song that dragged us to those banks and cast us in. I love you, the angles of it scraping at each throat, 
shouldering past the swirling dust motes in those beams of light that whatever we now knew we could let ourselves feel new to climb. Oh, woods. Oh, dogs. Oh, tree. Oh, gun. Oh, girl, run. Oh, miraculous, many, gone. Oh, Lord. Oh, Lord. Oh, Lord. Is this love the trouble you promised? Thank you. Thank you. I also want to thank Karen and, and Stephanie and Lydia and uh, Shonda and the Annisfield Wolf, Wolf Organization for, for the opportunity to be here tonight. Let's give one more round of applause to Tracy K. Smith. We are going to take questions. So in a second here, I'm gonna hand the mic um, back to Tracy and there are gonna be floating mics in the crowd there and there. And uh, if you have a question, just gesture, raise your hand and uh, you'll get a mic. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I, I had the opportunity to meet Miss McKnight this, uh, this summer, and she loves me too. Um, but she said you had mentioned the possibility of doing something more with them, a musical, a project, some more writing. I wanted to hear about more about that. that. Yeah, yes. well, um, the reason I was down there was because um, I was working on a libretto for an opera that is based upon um, the history of black land ownership in the southern United States that has been fraught from basically day one of reconstruction with threats that are both legal and nefarious. Um, and so we were visiting um, communities like Hilton Head or um, Sapelo Island and uh, learning about life and history and resilience and and the different efforts that people are making there to protect and also disseminate this really beautiful culture. Um, so um, my collaborator, who's a composer named Gregory Spears, and I were there a number of times over the last three years with some musicologists who introduced us to the Gichi Gullering Shouters. And that artwork, the, the opera, is called Castor and Patience, and it will premiere in Cincinnati next summer. Thanks for asking. It's like everybody should just bring a mic of their own to things like this. <laughs> I just want to say you have a great speaking voice. You create pictures and imagery listening to your voice. Oh, thank you. I, I don't know where you are. I want to look at you. I'm way in the back, OK? OK, hi. I'll stand up, OK? <laughs> now, I would like to know, how did you get started in writing poetry? Um, I loved writing and reading poetry from childhood, but I didn't think it was a, a profession that I could aspire to. And when I got to college, I met a number of other young people who knew it was a profession that they could aspire to, who were writing poetry, calling themselves poets, hosting reading series. And I met the poets who were on the faculty at my, at my college and began to, what I felt like apprentice myself to this art form. Um, 
because I loved language, but because I also had come to understand that reading other people's versions of their own experience, be it real or imagined, helped me find the language to recognize and make sense of my own experience. And if you think about where you are at 19 or 20 in life, where everything is overwhelming and you feel lost most of the time, um, that was huge to be able to say, language can help me slow all of this down and feel like I can get some grounding in experience. And it's never stopped doing that for me. Well, thank you for your gift uh, and for sharing. And, and congratulations on being the Poet Laureate of the United States. What does that mean? Or do you have some official responsibilities? Can you talk about that? Uh, yeah, so my term ended um, in last May, and now we have Joy Harjo, who is a wonderful um, Poet Laureate and member of the Muskogee Creek Nation. Um, what did you do during the What did I do during my time? There, so I'll tell you, the responsibility is minimal. If you don't want to do much, you can give a reading and a lecture at the Library of Congress and, and just present um, your take on the art form in those, those ways. But there's so many resources that the Library of Congress has that a lot of people choose to do projects, and that's what I chose to do. I, I spent the years going into rural communities in the US that don't often have reading series or book festivals and talking, sharing some of my poems, but mostly talking about the work of other poets. Um, I wanted to get off the beaten path, but I also felt like this is a moment in America where all we are inundated with are ideas of division and difference and how region means that we can't hear or respect one another because our values are so different. And I, I knew that poetry could help get past that narrative because poems make you sort of stop and pay really close attention and say Some, someone else is speaking here and it feels like it matters. And so to go into many different kinds of settings like community centers or libraries, but also rehab centers or prisons with different configurations of community and saying, what do you hear? How does this speak to life as you've experienced it? It felt like a huge thing to be doing and it gave me so much hope about America at a time when very little else did. So I'm really grateful. Tracy, thanks for the beautiful reading. Um, one of the things that I appreciate and admire about your work is its relationship to traditional form, for lack of a better term. And I was wondering how your sense and your feeling about form has changed over the period of your writing. Um, when I was a student, I always felt like when my teachers gave me formal assignments, like sonnets or, um, you know, terzarima, they were constricting me. And I thought, I have to do this if I want to call myself a poet, but that's not what poetry has to be about. And as I get older, I realize the constraint can help clarify and rein in what might otherwise be an unwieldy um, blur of emotions. And so form can make me think differently than I naturally would. And help me get to a different perspective. I turn to form when I feel most overwhelmed by the questions that, that are driving my poems. And I'm, I'm grateful for, you know, sometimes it's rhyme that says, you can't say what you want to say. You have to come up with something better. Um, because then I start to look at my problems differently. Hi, Tracy. How are you? I had a two-part question. What advice would you give to writers in regards to the business side of writing and also on crafting their creativity? Um, I feel like finding a community of fellow writers who work you... Um, you respect and want to help support and who feel that way about you is probably the best like professional decision that you can make as a writer because it it motivates you to keep growing it motivates you to not be selfish and egocentric because you're also hoping you can help your friend get her book published and um, that's I think because writing is a solitary act there is this 
of danger of becoming an egomaniac and you know thinking only about what's in it for you. Um, I say also that about community because my experience is that the path to becoming a poet with a book was very long. And I, there were moments when I thought, maybe, I, maybe this isn't going to happen. And so being able to say to my friends, we can do this, right? We can do this, was huge. Um, and then, I don't know. I mean, I'm, I hear myself saying this to my students, and I know it's not really what they want to hear, but if you can find a way that the process of writing and looking at the world like a writer is mostly what you care about, that's better than having the motivation be publications and prizes and awards. Um, there are great resources for information on those things. I think Poets and Writers Magazine is really great because they have a listing of book prizes and agents and editors and opportunities for submitting your work for publication. Um, and so that part of it can become almost like a methodical thing that you turn to once a month or once every six months and say, I'm going to send out all these poems and then get back to the good part of writing. Um, but um, the internet has changed a lot, too, with the advent of so many online publications um, and ways that you can bring your work out to different audiences without the intermediary of a publisher. Um, and in some ways, that helps the community that you belong to feel more immediate and, and larger, too. Hello, I was reading some literature that indicated that your parents were from Alabama, and so is my wife. And uh, I just wonder what the, the family experiences were like in Alabama. Um, my dad was in the Air Force, and so I grew, ended up growing up in California after my family had moved around a lot. Um, my parents both came from rural Alabama, uh, small towns just about 40 miles outside of Mobile. Um, they grew up in the 30s and 40s in segregation. Um, and my father always said that he, he joined the Air Force because the South was too hot and he wanted to get to another part of the country. But I've always taken that to mean much more than that. Um, and I feel in some ways like, um, the South that my parents belong to is a part of me. I cleave to the stories and even the voices and the inflections that they transmitted to me from the past that they, that they remembered as formative for them. Um, my parents were also of a generation that um, my mom participated in some of the bus boycotts in um, Montgomery. Um, but they didn't want to tell us too much about what they'd endured. They wanted to create in us a sense that what we wanted to do with our lives was possible if we worked hard. And I know that's, you know, that sense of exceptionalism and something that's been really important in the black community. Um, after my parents died, I chose to write a memoir as a way of almost asking more of the questions that I hadn't asked them, you know, about their actual lives and what had hurt them or what. Um, what had shaped and taught them. And so kind of thinking backward and asking my aunts and uncles for those stories and imagining who my parents might have been before they were my parents um, was one way of trying to have that conversation. Um, a lot of my aunts and uncles ended up moving to New York and Connecticut in the 60s and 70s, and a number of them have since moved back to Alabama. And so I find that that sense of home is something that is... Um, it never the, the the urge for it never goes away, and it means many many things, and sometimes um, conflicting things at the same time. Hello, I'm over here. Hi. Uh, thank you very much for your beautiful words. It seems you've appeased the weather of Cleveland for now. <laughs> Uh, you have given some wonderful advice to the students in this audience, but my question is relatively simple for poets who are just beginning. How do you begin? 
<laughs> That's a good question. Um, I felt so eager for some silence um, when I was 19, and that was a long time ago. The world was quieter then by comparison, and so I can imagine that that urge might be even more manifest right now. I think you begin by going to um, a space within your life where all of the other distractions can go away, and you can hear what I believe we each have, which is your inner voice, which is strange. And it's smarter than you are, and it's braver than you are. And if you can um, sort of trust it, then you can begin. And you start writing, and you say, this, I don't know why I'm saying this, but I'll just say it. And, um, and then you start saying, well, what would, I, what would I ask if I could ask someone who knows the answers? And, and you ask, and you listen to that voice, which knows some of the answers. And then you find other things that you love about language like rhyme or images or form that can help you move forward into those questions toward what feels like resolution. It might not mean the question is answered once and for all, but maybe the music of the poem feels correct. And so you get to a place that feels like a little toehold. Um, and then you find other people who are hoping to do the same thing and you do it together. Thank you so much for coming to be with us. Um, I hear a lot of love in your work, and I also hear the processing of a lot of pain. I think about it like spinning straw into gold, but I know that um, that can be difficult. So my question is, what do you do as a black female writer to take care of yourself in this world, and especially in this day and age? Well, one thing that I love, I mean, when I think about what, what blackness is for me, you know, that's a question that's like, you can't nail it down. But there's joy and there's laughter, often in the darkest, most difficult moments. And that's what home was for my parents, right? The ability to say, yes, this happened, but I'm going to make you laugh. We're going to revel in this thing that we're doing together, which is living. And I feel like um, that's what I try and do. I go to the place and to the people. Mostly now it's my husband and my kids who I can laugh and be foolish with and also say, OK, this world is messed up. We're going we're gonna to have some fun and then get back to work. You know, I love my, my peers, my, my poets that I, that I came up with. Um, because I feel like we're doing that together in different ways, that sense of fellowship, really. Hi. I'd like to preface this by saying I'm over here. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, that wasn't the preface. <laughs> <laughs> by saying I love you, OK? Well, I love all of you, sort of. Uh, <laughs> no, I do. Anyway. Um, I'd like to know, since you mentioned your writing process and using um, formal and or traditional modes of writing your poetry, and there's a lot of passion and a lot of hurt and a lot of pain and a lot, a lot, a lot of, when does form, that Eurocentric form, become a filter? And how do you get past that? Um, I think when, when I'm writing, and I think this is probably true for other writers, oh, I love you. <laughs> <laughs> um, when I'm writing, I, I've learned to recognize when I'm hiding behind something. Sometimes it's something that I think I know how to do well. And sometimes it's something that I think can stand in for what might be more difficult. And I let's say, OK, you can do that right now. But we're going to come back to this. And you're not going to do that again. And, and so knowing that there's a moment when I'm going to have to break past that. And if form seems to become one of those um, 
strategies for hiding or for failing to push um, courageously into the material, then I have to be willing to get rid of the form that I've chosen. I think I'm always using a form. I mean, I believe that a line length, a stanza length, a spacing on the page is a, a, a formal, a, a conscious choice, and that it, it activates certain possibilities or it shuts off certain avenues. And if those things are inhibiting what the poem is seeking to do, then I have to move past them. Um, sometimes you don't see that until the poem has lived a while, and then you, you realize, oh, I, I think I can fix this now. I'm ready to fix this now. Um, sometimes it's somebody else that you trust who says, that's not really enough that's happening here. Do you mind if I ask another? Um, it's from what you read, and I can tell you the letter one had me weeping back here. Um, is it, it seems to me that it would be hard to put that passion or the things that you read and it just erupts in um, emotion to try to like, okay, stand, I mean, and I guess you addressed that already. It's just, I don't know, I, I find it hard to bridle that in some sense. I do, I used to do spoken word or whatever they term it now and I listen to a lot of spoken word poetry and it's raw and it's out there and it's like boom, shit, bam and um, I guess I'm not criticizing you, I'm just asking something, I don't know. It's just, <laughs> yeah. I have always been interested in what um, what we sound like beneath all the external layers of who we are. So what is the voice of thought? Or what is the voice of our deepest self? And in my imagination, that's a quiet thing. I don't think it's passive, but it, it is beneath the need to present um, drama. It sits underneath the physical voice and that's the layer that I'm hoping to tap into when I, when I sit down to write. I love work that does many different things, but that's one thing I know about my voice. I'm interested in what is s nearly silent, but um, undeniable in a way. Okay. Hello. Hi. I want to thank you for, in particular, the poem Watershed. And I want to thank Karen Long for pointing it out to me. And I want to thank you for your reflections on inner voice, because reading Watershed actually did name some of my experience and what I've heard in my voice. So I know it's a particular poem, but I wonder if you happen to be aware of anything that that poem has uh, watered, so to speak, downstream mm. of having written it. Um, I'll tell others about that poem who haven't read it. It's, um, it's another found poem. It comes from existing sources. And one source is uh, an article by Nathaniel Rich that was published in the New York Times Magazine a few years ago that um, exposes the DuPont Chemical Company's illegal dumping of PFOA in Ohio rivers that has um, basically spread to every part of the planet, and it's deadly, and it causes cancer in humans and animals. And um, we all have bits of this in us because the fish that we eat have it, et cetera. Um, and they did this and denied responsibility. Um, and they did it after they knew that it was dangerous because it was profitable to use. Um, the other source material for that poem comes from the narratives that people submit anonymously or semi-anonymously, sometimes online, of near-death experiences that they had. So it's not like, oh, I almost got hit by a car, but I got hit by a truck and I was dead in the hospital for two minutes. And while they were reviving me, I went somewhere and this happened. I'm really fascinated by that um, 
those narratives, and I lived for a long time with such a rage about that article, and I knew I wanted to write about that somehow. Um, when love came into my imagination for the, these poems, I thought that love, which is such a huge part of the vocabulary of these near-death experiences, might be a really interesting counterpoint to the really cynical, profit-driven cruelty um, that characterized the DuPont company and lots of other companies, too. I don't know what if that poem has done anything. I hope that article has done a lot. And I know the lawyer that's named is still working on this case. Um, but um, thanks for mentioning it. Thank you very much. Good evening, everyone. My name is Stephanie Hicks Thompson. Thank you all for being here. On behalf of the Cleveland Foundation and Cleveland Book Week, I'd just like to take a moment to thank our event partners, Brews and Prose, and our amazing hosts, the Great Lakes Science Center and the William Mather Museum. Thank you for those of you who took the opportunity to take a tour. Um, I'd like to thank Shonda and Tracy for your beautiful words one last time. <laughs> and for withstanding Cleveland's weather. Uh, Tracy will be staying and signing books with us. Books are for sale, both Shonda's and Tracy's for sale by Max Bax in the back. Um, and she'll be signing right up here shortly. If you don't mind forming a line here behind the podium, we'll get started. Um, thank you all for being here as a part of Cleveland Book Week. For those of you who are going to join us tomorrow at the Annisfield Wolf Book Awards, we will see you there. For those of you who maybe aren't able to join us, you can view it live online at annisfield.org dash wolf.org and there's more information about that up front so thank you all for your time again and uh, please form a line right here to speak with Tracy